recording and then welcome everyone and welcome to lecture number two of the bioinformatics course. Um, today we will be talking about phenotypes and databases which contain a lot of phenotype information. Alright, so let me close some windows and I think we're all set to go. Um, so for today we will be talking about phenotypes and I will be using the word traits or trait as well. Hello Commando471. You're an active viewer actually. Um, so phenotypes or traits uh, can come in two different ways. They can be qualitative and quantitative. Um, in genetics we also have another classification so we either talk about phenotypes or traits being Mendelian or being complex. Um, we will talk a little bit about statistical analysis. Statistical analysis will come back more and more and every lecture has a little bit of it but um, I just wanted to run through a little example that I made a couple of years ago. Um, it's actually from a published paper that we published and had just wanted to show you some figures and explain how you can kind of look at those figures. And then we will talk about different phenotype databases. So in case you're a researcher and you don't have a lot of money, um, but you still want to do nice research, then you can kind of borrow all the stuff which is out there um, because a lot of people capture a lot of phenotypes or a lot of traits and they put them in big databases so you can get a whole bunch of data for free um, which since I'm Dutch I like because I'm Dutch people don't like paying for stuff um, and getting stuff for free is something that we really really enjoy um, and then I have a little word about project planning or why it is important to contact a bioinformatician when you are starting up a new project um, so those will be the topics for today. Um, I don't have any pen and paper. Let me get some paper as well so I can make some notes, write down some questions that you guys have and other suggestions. All right, so phenotypes. Um, so phenotypes or traits um, kind of come into two major groups and one of the groups that people talk about when they talk about phenotypes is usually the classical phenotypes. Um, so nowadays we also have things like endophenotypes which means for example the expression level of a gene um, or um, the amount of mRNA that you are producing or pff, an amount of metabolite that a certain cell has. But um, normally when we talk about traits and since I want to start from the beginning we talk about classical phenotypes. So phenotypes or or, or observable elements of an animal or plant um, which are interesting for economic reasons or other reasons like people just like, like it. So very classical phenotypes are things like yield, so how much yield do we get from a certain plant, uh, things like flowering time, so how much time does a flower need from being a little plant to getting its first flower, um, so generally flowering time can be defined as two periods. You have the periods until it from the seed to germination and then from germination to flowering. Um, so that's kind of the flowering time of a plant. Um, but other classical phenotypes which have been well studied in genetics um, are things like human stature. Um, so how high a person is, what is its BMI and these kinds of things. Um, and hey, of course all of these classical phenotypes have been used for many many years as markers uh, when you do plant and animal breeding, right? Um, when you think about things like potatoes, hey, the quicker a potato flowers, um, the quicker you can harvest the potato in the end. Um, so hey, planting potatoes which have a very short flowering time will in the next generation give you um, potatoes quicker. Um, and the same thing holds for yield. If you have a cow which gives a lot of milk, so high milk yield, and then of course this cow you would preferentially breed um, compared to a cow which has a low milk yield. Alright, so the difference here or the thing that I want to make get across here is, is that many of these classical phenotypes are also markers. So they, they are something which you can observe but are not the thing that you are directly interested in. 
Um, so we'll get back to that in a couple of seconds. But um, hey, why does a bioinformatician like myself concern myself with phenotypes? Um, well, here you see uh, a picture by uh, Lemnatech, um, and this is how they grow plants. So all of their plants are more or less on a conveyor belt system, and that means that all of these plants are scanned two or three times a day, automatically in a little room, and all kinds of phenotypes are gathered from these plants, like how big is the plant, what is the color, how much water does it have, how do the leaves look, how many leaves does it have. And so there's a big amount of automation currently going on in, or in biology and of course this automation means that there's more data to process um, leading to a phenomenon which we call big data. And big data is one of these kind of buzzwordy terms in bioinformatics is like what do you do well I deal with big data um, but big data can mean anything from a couple of hundred MBs to literally terabytes of data um, hey, but of course when you're doing a system like this so you're having plants which are on rails which are photographed and scanned two or three times a day and then of course for each plant you get a lot of data like have you get two or three pictures you get some machine learning output like how many leaves does it have and all of these things have to be stored in a database and then in the end statistics has to be done on all of this data that you have gathered don't forget recording no I'm I'm, I'm recording we're already like um, six minutes in so that that's fine thank you commando for reminding me um, I think it's more important to remind me after the breaks after the breaks I generally tend to come back and just ramble on uh, on the next slide but and because of this automated phenotyping um, bioinformaticians get more and more um, uh, interested or get more and more involved in in the 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 gathering of data on phenotypes. Hey, it used to be that kind of sequence was the base level of bioinformatics or so everything which had to do with DNA sequence or protein sequence you would go to a bioinformatician but nowadays a lot of the classical phenotypes which used to be measured by either PhD or master students on a field um, are now automatically gathered using a computer using optical sensors and, and other things. Um, so I have asked a friend of mine who is um, doing closed ecosystems uh, to tell a little bit about his project. So I will see when that lecture will be, but I think somewhere in the beginning of January, um, I will invite him to share like a little bit of his insight on, on how he does this automated phenotype capture um, for his closed ecosystems. Um, so I think that's going to be a very interesting lecture also for me I haven't seen a lot of his work but I know kind of what he's doing um, but it's interesting that him, we can have a discussion about how he is using bioinformatics in, in gathering his phenotypical data or his, his measurements. So it didn't really used to be a field of bioinformatics but nowadays phenotypes and measuring phenotypes is more and more becoming an automated system meaning that bioinformatics is involved in, in processing this. Alright so a question for you guys because we're talking about phenotypes and we're talking about markers um, and if we are I'm showing you two pictures here so on the one side we see a nice black and white cow like we see them all over Germany and on the other side you see more or less a different type of cow which you also see a lot um, but what is the difference between these two cows because there is a very clear difference between these two cows which you can just see from their appearance. Um, so if you have any idea what the difference is between these two cows then throw it in the chat and then we can discuss about that and um, I'm hoping that um, we will get some answers. Um, <coughs> the coloration pattern and the expression of pigmentation yeah 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 that's the most obvious difference between these two cows of course what you can see. Um, but there's a very there's a very economical phenotype on which you can kind of classify these two cows as well which is not directly obvious from the coloration pattern. The coloration pattern here is a is a marker for something which is really important when you are breeding cows. Uh, the genotype, yeah the genotype will be completely different as well. They're actually two completely different cow breeds. Alright, so the one on the right is not a milk cow, maybe more for meat. Yes, that's the right answer. So the black and white Frisian Holstein is for milk 
and the other one is for meat. And just by looking at the cows you can already see, right? So if, if you have a baby cow and you look at the coloration, um, you, can, you can, from the colors that the cow has and the color pattern that the cow has, you can already see if the cow will be a milk cow or if it will be a meat cow. Um, so he here we have something which is clearly observable, a phenotype which we are very uh, which we are not really interested in, right? We don't care if our cow is black and white or if it's gray. But the phenotype that we're interested in is highly linked to this coloration. So when you see a cow which is black and white, you know that it will be a milk cow. And when you see a cow which, which is more or less a single color cow and it's kind of brownish, then you, you know that this cow is going to be a good meat cow instead of a milk cow. So here we have, like, what I'm trying to get across is that there is an observable phenotype, the color pattern, and there's an unobserved phenotype which we're really interested in, and which is linked to the phenotype that we can observe. So milk production in this case is highly linked to the coloration of the cow. All right, so very good. So again, another picture, or another two pictures. So what is the difference between these two types of tomato or potato plants? Um, so a slightly more difficult question. And again, here we have a very clear observable phenotype, so there's a massive difference in the color. Um, but which color is doing what and why is that important? So just throw it in the chat. Can't be crazy enough, there are no wrong answers. and um, the more answers we get, the better it is, I think. I should have taken a picture of two fish, because there's a lot of people from the fish department that are following the course, so um, coming with potatoes might have not been the best when there's not a lot of people that are interested in agriculture, but more people who are interested in fish. All right, no guesses, no guesses whatsoever about the different colorations of the of the potato plants. Atoll Bay, size of the potato. Um, no, the size of the potatoes can be very different, but it can be very similar. All right, Jan Hage says there are also two strains. Um, one is more poisonous, starch and sugar. The difference in color attract different insects. Well, insects don't really see color, they see in a UV spectrum. The one is a GMO, no, they're definitely both like normal, natural occurring flavors. So the one that's closest is Jan. So Jan, you're more or less right. So the one which has the white flowers is potatoes which are used for consumption. And the other ones, the ones with purple flowers, they are the ones which are used for starch production. So next time that you're on your bike and you're biking through Brandenburg and you see a field of potatoes, then based on the color of the flower, you can actually see what these potatoes will be used for. So the white ones are the ones which have a high sugar content, low starch content, so they're really nice to eat. And the ones which are purple, they have a high starch content, so they are grown for like the chemical industry uh, to make things like glue and, and other things in which you use starch. Um, so. Again, very clear observable phenotype, and there's a difference in color, and based on the difference in color you can directly say, oh, this is the potato plant that I want. Um, so hey, if you're growing potatoes at home and the potato starts flowering, uh, make sure that the flowers are white, because the purple ones, they don't really taste very good. So this is a very old observation. This is something that people already knew in like 16, 1700 when they were growing potatoes and they were breeding cows, right? They had no idea about genetics and DNA is something that has been invented in like the 1950s, 1960s or perhaps a little bit earlier, the idea of DNA. Um, and so it's completely unrelated to anything about sequence. It's just that you have an observable phenotype and this observable phenotype is just by experience a good marker for an economically interesting trade. Um, so in this case, white, you can eat them, purple, you can make glue of them or something else. All right, so here we've been talking about phenotypes and how phenotypes can be markers. I want to take one step back and first describe phenotypes as being um, 
as, as and when we talk about phenotypes, there are things which are qualitative properties, um, which are properties that are observed but are generally not measured with a numerical result. So, for example, a piece of meat tastes good or it has a really nice texture. And these things you can generally not really quantify. You can say, well, this piece of beef is this many kilograms per square meter or these kinds of things. Hey, you can only put a, a qualitative measurement on it. So you can say this is a good quality or this is a bad quality. Um, and on the other hand, we have phenotypes which are uh, which have a quantity property um, hey, and that, that those are properties so uh, quantitative traits which have a magnitude or multitude so something that you can measure like color um, which has like an RGB value or another type of, of, of definition of, of color um, hey, the same thing holds for things like um, height um, Hey, you can say, well, I like people who are big or I don't like people who are small, um, but something like height is per definition a quantitative phenotype because it has quantity properties, meaning that you can measure height in either meters or centimeters um, and you can use this numerical value to compare two things. So when I talk about quantitative and qualitative things, um, there's always something that requires discussion. So let's just go through the list and say um, if something is a qualitative or a quantitative trait. Um, so something like high fat milk yield, um, just throw in chat, is it quantitative or is it qualitative? Testosterosaurus is qualitative. Well, if you would say that high is good, uh, then it is quality, right? But in this case, it's really a quantitative thing. You can you can quantify how much fat per kilogram milk is there. Um, no, don't be sorry. Just it's good that you throw in some suggestions right that like it like I said there's no real wrong answers but in this case I would say that high fat milk yield so is something that you can express as a numerical value you can say I have this many units of fat over this many units of um... <laughs> now don't be mean Ethel B <laughs> if you say high or low then it's a quality yes yes so if you would if you would say that and fat milk yield is is quantitative and high is good or bad then hey you might want to um, and normally when we talk about these things um, high fat milk yield is generally having good qualities for cheese making or bad qualities for cheese making so then hey you would you would put a quantitative trait um, has something that you can measure but then you would put a quality on there so meat structure um, Let's go ahead and get some suggestions. Hey Sandra, welcome to the stream. Didn't see you saying anything before. Quality, yeah, that's indeed quality. So the structure of meat is something that is very hard to grasp in numbers. Um, so in that sense, it's a it's a qualitative trait. Um, hey, if you talk about meat structure, then you can you have people who like a lot of fat on the meat, and you have people who don't like fat at all. Um, so the amount of fat on meat, or the amount of marbling, as it's officially called. There are nowadays some ways of measuring it, and because again it's kind of a fat over protein ratio, um, but which structure people prefer is very different between people, so it's really a qualitative trait. Um, starch content, um, just throw in your suggestion. Um, quantitative, yes, very good testosterosaurus. You're now really getting excited about getting the right answers. All right, wine quality. Come on, people, wine quality. Is wine quality qualitative or quantitative? Okay, so in this case, uh, Alexandra is, uh, is, is right. It's actually both. Wine quality nowadays is a quantitative as well as a qualitative trait um, because in the old days it used to be a very qualitative trait so there would be 
some guy who has a degree in phenology and that would taste the wine and then would say this is good wine or this is bad wine. However, nowadays all of this wine tasting is more or less done by robots. So the wine is just put into a machine and the machine then says I'm giving this wine a score of 7.3 and then the next wine that it puts in it gives a score of 6.8. Um, so the, the qualitative trade of wine quality has been changed into a quantitative trade by being able to measure all kinds of these properties from these f from this wine and so the the robot it analyzes the wine and then based on its analysis it gives us a, a quantitative score so wine quality used to be qu qualitative now it's definitely a quantitative trade um, because the measurement is not really done by people anymore but it's really done by robots. Alright so last two I think we can uh, do that in one go so flowering time and racing time quantitative or qualitative just throw it into the chat and then we can uh, we can see. Alright so I see quant Qualitative, quanti, quanti, quantitative. Yeah, so it's something that you can measure in seconds or or hours or these kinds of things. Um, so it's it's definitely a quantitative trade. Um, flowering time is usually measured in days, uh, while racing times for horses and stuff are in the order of a couple of minutes. Um, but here there's a very definite time component. So um, the time component is something that you can measure, um, and very definitely a quantitative trait. Alright, so if I would kind of describe the world, then all of the phenotypes fall into this big circle. So all of the traits are qualitative traits, because any trait that there is, you can say if it's good or if it's bad. Um, however, a small part of the qualitative traits can also be measured and given a unit, so then they become quantitative traits. And like we saw with the wine, um, this quantitative circle is growing and growing and growing so it becomes bigger and bigger the more we are able to catch things like quality measures into a quantitative way and so developing a new wine tasting robot takes away a phenotype from the qualitative circle and makes the quantitative circle a little bit bigger um, so it, the definition is is that something is a quantitative trait when you can measure it using the international system of units a qualitative trait is something which is very subjective so different people will give different grades to the same thing and of course if you're measuring a mouse then of course not everyone measures exactly the same but in the end people measure a certain amount of centimeters and that's it there's no real discussion about it while a qualitative trait there's always discussion what's good what's bad what do we want um, and this is very difficult for um, breeders because for breeders qualitative traits are very difficult to deal with um, so I've once been part of a research on Brussels sprouts and this was an interesting research because we were looking at um, um, like what is the amount of sugar into Brussels sprouts and uh, how bitter are they and uh, we did this together with Wageningen University and Wageningen University they have this tasting panel of people and then we found out that we could um, that there was like a genetic switch so at a certain locus in the genome you could determine how much sugar versus how much bitter there was um, and so just by by having a certain genotype at this locus then the plants would become more bitter having the other genotype means that there would be more sugar so for a geneticist this is a very nice thing right we have a genetic locus on the genome which controls the phenotype of interest but then when it came to the taste panel we actually ran into a massive issue because the taste panel consisted of people who liked bitter and people who liked sweet so in the end the breeder that wanted to have like what should we do should we make our brussels sprouts more bitter or should we make them more sweet we couldn't give them an answer because the the, the tasting um the, the 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 tasting panel could not agree um and in that sense the only um reason uh that we had um yeah i have a moderator for that anna can you uh just mute the uh, the 
the tall 506 with uh, the, the spammy things. Um, so and like the moral of this story is sometimes you can have a really nice qualitative trait yeah, so uh, or you can have a really nice quantitative trait you can measure how much uh, how much um, sugar there is you can measure on how much um, how bitter it is um, but in the end if the the experience of the user is qualitative so if they are wanting sugary brussels sprouts or if they're wanting brussels sprouts which are very bitter then in the end you cannot decide. The only thing that we could adv advise the breeder is that they should sell two types of Brussels sprouts. One which is more sweet than the current ones or they should sell another type which is more bitter than the other ones and then they could have like a, um, a genetic difference between the two species. Um, but then the breeder said no we, we can't do that. We can't have a double investment and, and buy twice the amount of space in the supermarket. Um, so a very interesting research um, have we found a really nice genetic effect but in the end this did not lead to any new product being put on the market um, because the people in the tasting panel could not agree on which direction um, we should go on. Alright so another kind of definition which is in quantitative and qualitative traits is that you can have a Mendelian trait. So Mendelian means that there's one gene or genetic locus involved in, uh, in, in controlling your phenotype um, so something like dwarfism is a Mendelian trait, right? There's a single gene and if that is broken uh, then you become, uh, you, you, you have like a limited growth. Um, so uh, but not all types of dwarfism actually are Mendelian traits. Um, and there are complex traits, so complex traits just means that there are two or more genetic loci involved in making the phenotype um, or expressing the phenotypes. So most phenotypes that we have, um, that we are investigating nowadays are complex phenotypes because almost all Mendelian phenotypes um, have been found or have been defined. Um, so there's, there's, there's not a lot of work anymore for people who do Mendelian genetics. Um, has so most phenotypes currently are things like intelligence, um, have where there's hundreds of genes involved uh, and we call these things complex. Alright so when we talked about um, or when I talked about the uh, quantitative traits um, I was talking about uh, uh, the system of units so the international Committee on System of Units and um, there are actually seven fundamental SI units and a question to you guys is, um, and that's why I needed a pen, is um, what are the seven fundamental SI units? So just throw something in, I already mentioned a couple of them, um, so um, I'm just curious to see how, how much people remember from um, high school. Um, I think this is something that they should teach in high school um, because it's kind of fundamental, right? Like how do you describe the universe? Well, if you're measuring things inside our universe, um, then you're always measuring one of seven of the SI units or you're measuring like a, a combination of these uh, SI units. So, all right, so we have mole, Kelvin, meter and kilogram and then we have time in seconds um, mole and mole kilograms yes length length that that fits in with something in meters so there's two things right there's there's the there's the unit and then there's the um, um, the, the the thing that you're wanting wanting to measure Kandel Kandel Right, we just put it on the list. So now we have mole, kelvin, meter, kilogram, time, um, length, and condel. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we should have all seven. Mass. Yeah, so mass is, is something that you would express in, in, in kilograms. Light. Yes, yes. All right, so the seven fundamental SI units as they are defined are length, and length is officially measured in metre, not meters, but metre. We have mass, mass is measured in kilogram. We have time, which is measured in seconds. We have electric current, also measure, or measured in ampere. 
We have thermodynamic temperature, which is measured in Kelvin. We have amount of substance, which is measured in mole. And we have luminosity intensity, which is measured in candela, or CD. And th these are the only seven fundamental SI units that are there. And we owe these to the French, except for one. And do you know which one is not a French unit? Kelvin, yeah, that's correct. Lord Kelvin was a nobleman from the UK, um, and um, all the other ones are French. And the reason why the French came up with this standardization system is actually quite an interesting story, and it has to do with the fact that France traded with countries like Spain and Germany and the UK and Holland, and the problem there was that everyone was using their own units. So something in an old measurement would be a hand or a foot. Um, and of course, a, an English foot used, used to be different from a Dutch foot. Um, so head, that would be a massive issue if you would do trades because you would expect like a certain amount of stuff and you would only get like two thirds of it just because the guy that you bought it from had a certain different understanding of fundamental units. Um, so the French were, um, uh, the official kilogram is located in France. Yes, the kilogram is defined as a block of platinum, I say. It's kind of a block of metal somewhere. Um, and there are actually six kilograms scattered around the world. Um, one of them is still located in French, somewhere near the Eiffel Tower. Um, and they recently, or like a couple of years ago, they brought all the six official kilograms back together and then they figured out that all of them had a slightly different weight so if you would weigh them then they would not be the same weight anymore while originally when they were made they were made very accurately and had, um, so um, th th there is a problem in this this having something define a unit um, but the kilogram um, is is a, a physical object which is located in in France um, there's five um, more or less backup kilograms scattered across the world um, but these all weigh a little bit different um, so the current idea is to redefine the kilogram as not being a kilogram anymore um, but to define it as a cube of silicium atoms or a, a not a cube but a sphere of silicium atoms um, and since silicium has a, a known um, molecular weight and if you have a sphere which is a perfect sphere you also know how many mole of substance is in there then you can define that as being the kilogram um, so there are some um, some ways of kind of redefining these units but the kilogram was the last unit to go from a physical object definition to a molecular definition and things like seconds are based on um, the amount of um, vibrations of a quartz atom um, and these kinds of things and luminous intensity is, uh, is as well but all of these units are thanks to the French because the French were sick and tired of being scammed over during trade because hey, if they would trade with a Dutch guy they would get like less than they would expect it and if they would trade with a, with a Spanish guy then the prices would be too high because the Spanish guy would have a different definition of what is a, a, a kilogram in a way. So after the French got screwed over enough they actually decided we don't want that anymore and we're just going to standardize everything and force everyone to kind of um, use our system which kind of worked out for them alright so enough about the uh, fundamental units so um, let's go into some more genetic aspects so let's talk more about Mendelian where there's one genetic locus and talk more about complex traits where there are um, more two or more genetic loads are involved and of course you can kind of mix and match this you can have a qualitative trait um, which is Mendelian but you can also have a complex qualitative trait um, and the same thing holds for quantitative traits you can have quantitative traits which are complex and there are quantitative traits which are Mendelian of course so all right so and when we go back and we talk about phenotypes or we talk about traits then of course the first guy that you have to talk about is Gregor Mendel um, so Gregor Mendel was a German um, 
monk slash scientist who was really interested in um, how phenotypes are transferred from parents to offspring. So he did a whole bunch of experiments, very famous experiments using peas, um, so the little things that you uh, that you eat, um, and he looked at the shape. and uh, There will be a slide about some of his work, um, but he was the first one to to come up with a theory um, which is called the gamete slash gene theory, um, which is kind of a, a beads on a string theory. So his theory was that. Um, there is something like a, a rope um, and there are different phenotype beads on this rope and hey, so you have a, a rope and then there's a bead and this bead says color then there's another bead which says shape and then there's another bead which says length um, and his idea was that if you have parents then both parents come with a string of these beads and then hey, when, when they create offspring, parts of these beads are transferred from the parents to the offspring. So, And this was a relatively new theory, um, especially because in this time um, the, the leading theory on how people got pregnant was still the homoculus theory, um, which was the idea that in the sperm cells of men there were like little people um, which would then grow inside of a woman. So hey, he was the first one to kind of ignore all of that and say no, hey, we have phenotypes and phenotypes are more or less attached to each other on a string and when parents mate then these, these beads they get mixed and then passed on to the children. And with that he could explain for example when you have two people, um, so a, a pair uh, of parents of one which is small and another one which is really big, why the children tend to be kind of the average between the two parents. Yeah, because he would say, well, no, then you have a small bead and you have a big bead. The child gets both beads, so that is why the child is kind of half of what the parent is. Um, and that was his that was his theory, and he had some data to back it up. Um, although most of this data we know today is probably a little bit polished, so it's not it's not perfect. Um, so, but. He had some good data to uh, at least back up his, his theory of, of, of genes and gametes. Um, and so he called these beads on a string, the beads, the individual beads were called genes and a whole string of these things is called a gamete. So a gamete is a combination of different phenotypes, um, more or less what we today would call a chromosome. But in his theory there was only one chromosome, um, so yeah, the parent had uh, both parents had one chromosome and the child got a combination of both chromosomes from, from the parent. Yeah, so that is why we still call a Mendelian trait a Mendelian trait, yeah, because there is a difference in a single gene, so a single bead, uh, which is causing the difference in the phenotypes which we can observe between um, um, individuals. Um, so a couple of um, interesting or interesting uh, phenotypes which are Mendelian is for example if you have wet or dry earwax. So if you just like go around in your ear and you look at your finger then you can more or less see um, which kind of the gene you inherited. If you have wet earwax um, you are generally more of uh, Asian descent while if you have dry earwax that means that you are more from European uh, descent. Um, and that is a very clear kind of separation. Um, on average, like 99 out of 100 Europeans will have dry earwax, and 99 out of 100 Asians will have wet earwax. And that just has to do with uh, a single gene. And if you have a mutation in this gene, you go from having dry to having wet earwax. Um, another very clear Mendelian trait is, of course, albinism. Um, and so if there's a, a there's a single gene which causes melatonin to be produced, eh, which gives you your skin color and also gives you the color of your eyes. And if this gene is broken and you can't make uh, the, the, um, um, the melatonin, uh, then you become an albino. So hey, you have white hair, white skin, red eyes, um, and that's just because there's one gene which is normally active that is broken. Another one which is pretty Mendelian, not always, is brachydactyly. So brachydactyly means having six fingers or having four fingers on a hand. Um, and the number of fingers is um, Mendelian inherited. So if both of your parents have um, 
uh, six fingers, then you will have six fingers as well because there's no no there's the, both parents have broken genes, so had the chances of you getting a, a functioning gene is, is almost zero. And then one of the uh, um, um, most interesting one is the ability to taste phenyl theocarbamide, um, which is one of the main component in Brussels sprouts. It gives that, that uh, um, um, it gives it the, um, the, the very specific taste of Brussels sprouts. Um, some people are not able to taste it and they like Brussels sprouts. Some people are able to taste uh, phenyl theocarbamide and they are not able to eat Brussels sprouts just because the taste of it is very chemical. Um, it's the same as with asparagus. Asparagus also have this um, substance in there. So when you eat asparagus then um, you don't notice any difference but when you then go to the toilet and you pee then you can either smell the asparagus in your pee or you can't smell them um, and this is kind of a one-to-one -one. and this is again a single gene on the genome uh, which gives you the ability to to smell or taste this this chemical um, and um, if this gene is broken then you can't and there's there's just a single gene so, and of course, there are literally thousands and thousands of phenotypes like this, uh, which are Mendelian phenotypes, and there's a big database, which we'll, we'll discuss later in the lecture, where you can look up all of these known Mendelian phenotypes. So if we look then at a cross diagram, right? Um, so, hey, I told you that um, if both of your parents have six fingers, then you're very likely to end up with six fingers as well. Um, and then had, we are usually referring to these things as cross diagrams. So here you see a, a cross diagram when we are talking about a, a single gene. So in this case, we have a gene which comes in two forms. So we have the A form, the big A, and we have the small a, so you can, for example, imagine that uh, big A is the ability to um, uh, to smell or to taste. Uh, uh, let me look that up. Phenyl theocarbamide, and the small a is the is the is you are not able to. Yeah, so you have a phenotype, or you you don't have that. So when you look at your mother and you look at your father, of course nowadays we know that your mother has two chromosomes and your father has two chromosomes. So your mother has two copies of the gene, your father has two copies of the gene. And this is more or less the default crossing screen. So here we have a mother which has two copies, so it, she has the ability to taste and she has another gene which does not work. Your father has a gene which works and another copy that doesn't work. Um, and then here, here we see the resulting possibilities. So you see that there are three possibilities in the children. So either the children have two broken genes, they have two functional genes, or they end up being similar to the, to the parents, meaning that they have one functional gene and one broken gene. Um, which is the same as the parents because here the mother has one broken gene and one functional gene and the same as, as the father. So I hope that I'm explaining this because it will be more complex and I have a question for you guys about, a, about kind of these cross diagrams as well um, because I think it's a very useful tool of understanding uh, genetics. Uh, the thing which was before on the board uh, was a big cross diagram um, from four different parents um, just so that I could work on a project where we had four different parents uh, which we mixed, so four different mice. Yeah, so if we're talking for example about mixing flour, so again we see the cross diagram here um, and here we see the parental genotype, so here we see that the mother has a, a, a white gene and a red gene, here the father has a white gene and a red gene as well, and then there's two things that can happen, um, because in genetics either phenotypes function in an additive way, so that means that when you have a red gene and a white gene, then the flower will be pink. Um, of course, when you get two white genes, you will be white. When you get two red genes, you will be red. However, and this is called additive inheritance. So it means that um, there's just a mixture of the two genes, um, so the phenotype will be in between these, the, the, the phenotype of the, of the, of the parent. Then we also have dominance, and dominance means that one of the genes is um, is kind of uh, overcompensating for the other one. 
right? So for example, if you have a dominant red phenotype in this example, and then of course the heterozygotes, they will have inherited one white allele and they will have inherited one red allele. Um, but in this case, um, of course, um, the, since the red phenotype is dominant, if you have a single gene working, you will get the red phenotype. And this is a very basic, um, a basic phenomena. Um, where sometimes you have to have two broken genes uh, before a certain phenotype shows. Um, so, and that is also the reason why um, as sometimes children can be affected even though both parents are not affected. Um, so, all right, so additive. So in additiveness, we see, of course, the standard Mendelian inheritance pattern of 25% red, 50% pink, and 25% white offspring. Well, if we have dominant phenotypes, then we have 75% of the offspring being red and 25% of the offspring being white. Um, and this is this is all still Mendelian theory, and this was all invented long before 1900. Um, so this this was well known that if you had phenotypes, that some phenotypes inherited in an additive way, and other phenotypes, Mendelian phenotypes, would in, be inherited in a dominant way. So the question that I always ask uh, the people here: How do the parents look? And if we first focus on this crossing scheme. Um, what are the colors of the parents? So what is the, the color of the mother and what is the color of the father? So that's a question to you guys. Um, just throw it in the chat. Um, will it be red? Will it be white? Or will it be pink? What is the color of the parent? All right, Alexandria. Pink, yes, so very good. So in this case, the parent will be pink. Um, and that is, of course, because when you mix a red allele with a white allele, you get a pink color. So here the parent will be pink. And in this case, the other crossing scream, uh, scheme, how will the parent look? Red. Very good, because the red is dominant. So if you have only one red allele, you will be red. So they look like this. This is a pretty hard question already. Like many people are kind of tricked by this because like they always think about two of the gametes but they never think about the phenotype of the parent. And of course this is very surprising that if you take two red flowers and you cross them together that all of a sudden 25% of the offspring will be white. Um, that's something that a lot of people don't, don't um, realize can happen. Um, but this is all very explainable, very basic Mendelian genetics. It's just a single gene causing it. So yeah, you have a broken gene and the broken gene doesn't function, so the, the red gene takes over. While well, in here you have kind of a mixture between the two. All right, very good, very good. Applause for yourself, pat yourself on the back. Um, very good. All right, so it's now almost 2.50. Um, so let's do um, like two more slides and then we'll take a little break. Um, so Mendelian inheritance was kind of the de facto, um, um, how do you call it, the de facto theory for inheritance. Um, but then in 1917, um, this guy Thomas Hunt Morgan, actually not he, but one of his students, observed a failure of uh, Mendelian inheritance. So they were doing experiments where they were uh, working on Drosophila and they were crossing the Drosophila and what they noticed is that some phenotypes did not seem to mix the way that Mendel had predicted. They, they seemed to be only occurring in one of the sexes. Um, and what they also observed is that some phenotypes seem to be connected, right? So if you would be uh, having a red color of, of eyes as a drosophila, then you were also more likely to have, for example, uh, large wings. So had they, these two things did not seem to be independent of each other. Um, and they, they had a really hard time explaining this because no one had the idea of a chromosome yet. So had that, since DNA wasn't known yet, people did not know how stuff got inherited from parent to children, um, but they did see that there was something which was sex specific, so it only occurred in females, 
but never occurred in males. And they seemed, and they had this observation where they saw that some phenotypes, like hey, when you think about this beads on a string thing, it seemed that this string, some beads were closer to each other than um, than other beads on this string. Um, hey, so th their observation was a very um, observation that they did based on thousands and thousands of Drosophila that they had, and Thomas Hunt Morgan is generally credited for launching the idea of a chromosome so that there are that there is not one string with beads on there but that there are multiple strings with beads on there and that one of these strings is determining your sex so and this was a revolutionary idea long before DNA was invented we we had they know that DNA more or less existed as a chemical substance but had they had no idea that it was the the fundamental carrier of genetic information um, and so Thomas Hunt Morgan actually developed his theories of chromosomes and linkage and um, used that to start making a genetic map using Mendelian phenotypes. So what they did is they, they measured the traits in the parents, then they measured the same traits in the offspring. Yeah, so they measured, for example, um, five different phenotypes, like the size of the eyes, the color of the eyes, the length of the wings, the size of the feet, um, the, the size of the abdomen. And then using these measurements from parents and children, they started calculating how often they co-occurred and how often they did not co-occur. Um, yeah, so that would that that led to this um, and that led to the first genetic map of Drosophila, um, and this is also why the unit of inheritance or the unit of linkage between two phenotypes on a chromosome is called a centimorgan or a morgan, um, because of his invention that, that that phenotypes are linked to each other, and that some phenotypes occur only in one of the sexes. So uh, this, this invention is uh, the first observation that they had was published in 1917 um, and had they started doing experiments um, and then had they did for example they have uh, the white eye gene which causes white eyes in Drosophila and then they have a gene which causes miniature wings are located on the Drosophila X chromosome, right? So they figured out that only females um, had a, um, uh, not only females but had they um, so this was their hypothesis and then they crossed a female white miniature right which has a WM slash WM gene with a wild type male so the, the male had W plus which is just big W meaning normal eyes normal wings and it had a Y chromosome and then what they observed is when they crossed this genotype with this genotype, so the, the genotype of the female with the genotype of the male, then they saw that males were white-eyed with miniature wings, so WMY, while females from this cross were wild-type for both eye colors and wing size, um, so they, they had um, had their inheritance so and males of course when you cross a female it always when you when you get a male out of it it always has the Y chromosome from the male so it cannot be anything else than getting the WM allele from the fe from the mother right so wide eyes miniature wings on the males however females were wide wild type for both eye color and wing size so um, had WM uh, W plus M plus um, W and M so the question here, is this a dominant or an additive inheritance? All right, so Jan Hage said dominant. And why do you think it's dominant, Jan? All right, now more people are chiming in saying that it's dominant. Good, so can, can, can anyone explain to me why they say it's, it's dominant? Like on an exam, then just answering dominant is good enough depending on how I phrase the question. All right, Jan Hage says, because the heterozygote females have it. Yes, so in this case, if you have a single functional wild type allele, like W+, plus, right, then you get the dominant so the W plus is dominant over W and the M plus, so the, the, the miniature wings, the, the 
the standard wings are dominant over um, the um, over the uh, miniature wings. So indeed, having one functional allele gives you the wild type, um, and head, there's no in between. So it's not that one of the eyes is white and the other one is black, and it's not that one of the wings is small and the other wing is is big. Um, so this is a very clear. Um, indication of a, of a dominant gene effect where having a functional gene um, makes it so that the, the phenotype of the non-functional gene is completely gone. All right, so let me do one more slide. Um, yeah, so they did more um, more f uh, more breeding experiments, but I, I think we should take a break first and then um, we'll come back and um, we can talk more about dominant and hemizygous and recessive genes. All right, so let's take a 10 minute break. I will be back at 3.05. Um, and someone remind me to start the recording when I get back. All right, so.